Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Morning Walk with the Apostles for Tuesday, July the 27th, 2021. As always, it's good to be with you this morning. I appreciate you taking time, those of you who are joining us live, taking time at this moment to be with us. But if you're joining us later, I appreciate you taking time to, to do that as well. It's always good to be able to sit down and open our Bibles together and take a look at what God says to us in His Word. This morning, let's begin, as always, with prayer, and then we'll get right into our lesson. Loving Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in our lives, and again, we thank you for a, another night's rest and a new, another new day. We just pray, Father, that this day you would continue to bless us and help us to see the blessings that you send, Help us to see the opportunities that come our way, that we might serve and do your will. Father, continue to be with those that have asked an interest in our prayers, those that are dealing with uh, physical difficulties and ailments, and we pray that you be with them and those who are charged with their health, those who are dealing with spiritual difficulties. Right now, Father, I just want to mention a young man that I learned about yesterday by the name of Montana. He's having some struggles with faith, and he's uh, wanting to walk away. And in fact, I guess has walked away. And I just pray that something will be said or done that will bring him back to you. And to you, your faith in you and in Jesus and in serving you. Father, be with us this day as we go about our activities. Be with us this hour as we study and look at your word. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, on this morning's walk, we want to conclude our look at Paul's farewell charge to the Ephesian elders. We have seen lessons for preachers last Friday, lessons for elders yesterday. This morning, let's look at some lessons that are here for the rest of the congregational membership. Although many of the applications made to elders and preachers could be made to any of us. In a sense, we are all leaders, for each one influences someone else. Therefore, we all need to study all of the Word, verse 32 of Acts 20. We all need to be teachers of the Word, Acts 20.20, 20, and we all need to need the hearts of servants. We all need to be unselfish and concerned about others, Acts 20.35. Further, we can learn from this passage what we should look for in preachers and elders. We need preachers who will preach the truth, who will tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear, and who will do so with compassion. We need elders who are mature, responsible men with shepherd hearts. Most of all, we must learn from this passage the secret of relationships, especially relationships in the church. A word not found in this passage and yet saturates the entire text is the word love. Paul did not send a messenger 30 miles from Miletus to Ephesus because he wanted to conduct a leadership training class. And the elders did not travel 60 miles round trip because they considered Paul an expert on leadership techniques. The emotion-charged scene that followed Paul's discourse shows why Paul sent for the elders and why they came. They had a special relationship. Let's read those last verses. Verses uh, 36 through 38. 
And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul, and especially, or excuse me, and repeatedly kissed him. Grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. They knelt down. We have spoken so often of kneeling in prayer that we may think that this was the most common stance in Bible times, but normally men stood when they prayed. When you read in the scriptures of men kneeling in prayer, invariably there was an emotional climate. Sometimes a feeling of guilt or of helplessness. Here in Miletus, the elders were overcome with sorrow. After weeping and hugging Paul, kissing him again and again, they went down to the ship to watch him leave. The original language of the first verse of chapter 21 indicates that Paul and the others had to tear themselves away from the brethren. I can just see the elders there on the dock, standing on tiptoe, waving until the ship disappeared from their sight. There was a special bond between Paul and these Ephesian elders. Preachers and elders should care for each other. That special feeling then should extend to preacher-member relationships, elder-member relationships, and member-member relationships. If love flows from heart to heart in the church, it will solve many problems. Acts 20 then closed with Paul's tearful farewell to the Ephesian elders. Chapter 21 begins in verse 1a, and when it came about that we had parted from them and had set sail. And as I said, the Greek text literally says, and when we had torn ourselves from them, we set sail. Now Luke, who was in Paul's company at this time, evidently kept a log of the journey. He recorded in the rest of verse 1 of chapter 21, we ran a straight course to Kaz, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Now Luke could have written extensively about those or on those uh, first two stops. In fact, let's let's switch over right quick uh, to a map and uh, take a look at this here. Uh, well, I've got the wrong map here. Let me go. There we go. There's the map I'm looking for. Here is Miletus, where they have been meeting with the Ephesian elders. And Paul and his group got into a ship and have sailed. Uh, I just put the orange arrow here to show the island of Kos and the island of Rhodes off of the coast of uh, what was called at that time Asia Minor, modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, the island of Kos was the birthplace of a man by the name of Hippocrates, and it was the home of uh, the world's most famous medical school of the first century. Now, the island of Rhodes was known for its cultivation of roses, and that's where the island gets its name. It was also, in the first century, known for the 
105 foot high bronze colossus, the Colossus of Rhodes, that once stood astride its harbor, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Now, by the time that Paul has arrived here uh, in Rhodes, and uh, an earthquake had broken the statue, and the ruins were still there, and it was still a very notable uh, attraction that people would uh, want to see. Luke, however, is not writing a travel brochure. He was telling of Paul's dash to Jerusalem, trying to hurry there before Pentecost, Acts 20, verse 16. Now, if Paul's company had continued on the ship they were in that had taken them from Troas to Miletus, <coughs> it was one that had stopped in almost every port. There would be no way for them to reach Jerusalem in time. When they docked in Patara, they were delighted to find an ocean-going vessel bound for Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia lay on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And let's go again back uh, to the map. And let me put in an arrow here for Phoenicia, the green arrow. Uh, Phoenicia lay on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea just north of Palestine. Now from Phoenicia, it would be easy uh, to travel to Jerusalem. You can see going on down from Tyre, which is in Phoenicia, uh, to Pato uh, Ptolemas, Caesarea, and then on down to Jerusalem. Luke said in verse 2, And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard, and set sail. So, unlike their previous coast-hugging craft, this ship headed across the Mediterranean straight for Phoenicia. Now, on the way, they passed south of the island of Cyprus, verse 3a, where Paul and Barnabas had begun the first missionary journey back in Acts chapter 13 and verse 4 about 10 years before this time that Luke's writing about now. However, the vessel did not stop until it, quote, landed at Tyre, verse 21, or verse 3b of chapter 21, and docked to unload its cargo. Now, I might mention that there is no discrepancy here in Luke's account. He recorded that their ship was, quote, crossing over to Phoenicia, in quote, verse 2. And verse 3 says they kept sailing to Syria, in quote. Now the country of Phoenicia was a region in the Roman province of Syria. So Paul, excuse me, Luke just uses two different references to talk about the same place. Now, Tyre was the principal city of Phoenicia. It is an ancient city familiar both to students of secular history and students of Bible history. Hiram, king of Tyre in the days of Solomon, furnished cedar for the building of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 10. Tyre is also mentioned in several Old Testament prophecies, particularly in Isaiah chapter 23, Ezekiel chapters 26 through 28, and Amos chapter 1 verse 9 and 10. Jesus even mentioned Tyre in his preaching, Matthew 11 verse 21, and he, Jesus visited the area around Tyre, Matthew 15 verse 21, and Mark 6 verse 24, excuse me, Mark 7 verse 24. When persecution by Paul and others had scattered Christians from Jerusalem, back in chapter 8, verse 14 of Acts, some, were told, had gone to Phoenicia, Acts eleven nineteen. 19. 
probably the congregation at Tyre had been established at that point. Years later, on his way from Antioch of Syria to Jerusalem, Paul had passed through Phoenicia, quote, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and bringing great joy to all the brethren. Acts 15, verse 3b. Perhaps Paul had met some of the brethren at Tyre at that time. Paul's ship evidently made good time across the Mediterranean. According to John Chrysostom, the journey took only five days. Although still committed in, to arriving in Jerusalem before Pentecost, Paul apparently now has time to spare. It would take days for his ship to unload in Tyre, but he was not worried. He used the time to deepen his ties with the brethren in that city. And so Luke would write in Acts 21, verse 4a, quote, And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, end quote. Now that Greek word that's translated looking up in that verse implies a diligent search. The city of Tyre was large. The congregation of the Lord's church was probably small. Now previously, Paul had thrilled the brethren in that area with an account of the success of the gospel among the Gentiles. We just mentioned a few minutes ago, Acts 15, verse 3. He could now bring them an update. Their special time of fellowship now was climaxed as they gathered around the table of the Lord on the first day of the week. One concern marred their time together. Verse 4b, quote, They kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem, end quote. Apparently, one or more of the brethren at Tyre had the gift of prophecy and kept warning Paul of the dangers that awaited him. See chapter 20, verse 3, but also chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, we'll see later. You know, I think if I had been Paul, I would have wanted to, to stay and enjoy the association with my brethren without thinking about the future but the Spirit wouldn't let him forget. Now, we've already seen how, quote, in every city, end quote, the Holy Spirit inspired men to remind the apostle that, quote, bonds and afflictions, end quote, awaited him. Chapter 20, verse 23. What a test this must have been of Paul's resolve to carry through on his mission. Now note the admonition of the brethren in Tyre for Paul, quote, not to set foot in Jerusalem, end quote. I doubt that this specific prohibition, not to set foot in Jerusalem, came from the Holy Spirit. Now bear with me a minute. For at least two reasons. First, Paul had always heeded the Spirit's prohibitions. Look back at chapter 16, verses 6, 7, and 8. If the Spirit had plainly told Paul not to go to Jerusalem, he surely would have complied with those instructions. Number two, Paul obviously considered himself under divine orders to go to Jerusalem. And the Spirit would not contradict himself. My guess as to what's happening here is that the Holy Spirit revealed to the brethren at Tyre that hardships awaited Paul in Jerusalem. And it was their conclusion that he should not go. We'll see the Holy Spirit's exact words next Monday when we look at verse 11. Here in chapter 21, the Spirit's warning 
was not intended as a prohibition, but rather a preparation, preparing Paul for what he had, could expect in Jerusalem. The week in Tyre passed quickly. Although formerly Paul had enjoyed only brief acquaintance with the Christians there, after seven days of fellowship, they parted the closest of friends. And so it has ever been in God's family. The parting scene here in Tyre is reminiscent of the fearful, ter fearful, excuse me, tearful farewell that we just read about in Miletus. Let's look at the one in Tyre in chapter 20, uh, excuse me, chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on, on board the ship, and they returned home again. Entire families came to tell Paul and his friends goodbye. Tears of men, women, and children mingled as they bid farewell to one willing to risk everything for the Lord. And we'll continue looking at Paul's journey on to Jerusalem, but it'll not be until next Monday. There will not be a morning walk with the apostles the rest of this week, Tuesday, uh, excuse me, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Linda and I are going to be out of town beginning tomorrow morning early uh, through late Saturday evening. We'll be with our kids and grandkids in the Fort Worth area. The reason for this little trip is that Friday, July the 30th, is our 50th wedding anniversary. They're not able to come to Hereford, so... We're going to them, and uh, we can all be together uh, for those few days. I hope that you have a great uh, Tuesday today, as well as the rest of this week. I'll put uh, Saturdays on uh, Facebook about our uh, a preview of the sermons for Sunday, and Lord willing, we'll be back here on Monday to continue journeying with Paul from Tyre to Jerusalem. Let's close our time this morning with prayer. Loving Father, thank you so much for your blessings in our lives and for the opportunity this morning of work of working through your word, of seeing the lessons that we can draw from Paul's time in Miletus and, and in Tyre. And we just pray, Father, that we've been encouraged by our, our being together this morning. Father, I pray your blessings upon us for the rest of this day and the rest of this week as we will not be gathering again in this way uh, until next Monday, although some will, will be able to gather with us on Sunday. I pray, Father, for the safety of travel for Linda and I as we go to be with our family. And I pray, Father, for uh, this those of the congregation here and those of the listening audience to Morning Walk devotionals that uh, we also that they also have a time of safety thank you so much G for jesus and his sacrifice and for the word that you've given to us we pray this in the name of jesus amen well you have a great rest of your tuesday and the rest of this week and lord willing we'll be back here on sunday with our regular services and on monday morning to continue a morning walk with the apostles.